Speaker is recognized. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I rise to speak about another part of the bill, but I want to th congratulate the chairman and his work with the ranking member, Senator Shelby, on reaching this agreement on resolution and too big to fail. It's an important step forward on this piece of legislation, critical part of the legislation. And I think it shows that there is really a lot of places where we can reach bipartisan consensus on this bill. It's my sense that the great and very positive work which was done here on, on resolution authority will hopefully, I would hope it would carry over to things like the derivatives issue, which needs to be worked on, uh, issues like underwriting standards, which need to be worked on, how the regulatory structure is created and, and how the chairs are moved around on in that area. All these issues, I think, have our fertile ground for reaching consensus. And I know the Senator from Connecticut has been very constructive in his efforts to reach across the aisle. And I just hope we can make progress on all these items because this bill can be a very strong and positive piece of legislation. And I hope it will end up that way. And I think this is a, a strong, a good step in that direction, a very good step. The announcement by the chairman on an agreement on resolution authority. I wanted to speak a little bit about a part of the bill that has really been ignored because there have been so many other big issues. That's what happens when you bring a bill, you know, this large to the floor. It's over here, <laughs> 1,400 pages. It's a big bill. It's got a lot of language in it. It had to be a, a large bill because it deals with complex issues. But included in this bill are some, is some language which was sort of baggage thrown on the train is the way I would describe it. And it's in the area of corporate governance. In fact, to a large degree, it, it by its own definition, has virtually nothing to do with financial regulatory reform. Uh, this language does a series of things. Primarily, it federalizes corporate law relative to the manner in which stockholders and directors uh, are treated and executives of corporations. Not limited to financial institutions, but to any publicly traded company. It guarantees what's known as proxy access under federal law. That's a right that has traditionally been set up by states. It sets up standards for how directors are elected under federal law for all companies. That's a right that's usually been reserved to the states. It even puts in place this a requirement that corporations disclose certain information which has absolutely no relevance at all to financial reform because it deals with every company in America that's publicly held, uh, such as the ratio of compensation between different workers within a company uh, and the manner in which boards of directors are elected whether they're all elected at once or whether they're elected under staggered terms. It is a major push by the federal government into an arena which has always historically been primarily the role of states. And it really steps all over states' rights. And, in my opinion, the right of shareholders to have companies which they're comfortable with are being well managed for the purposes of returning a reasonable return to the shareholders. And it will undermine shareholders' rights, in my opinion, not increase them. If you look at the proposal specifically, let's take proxy access. This is a term of art, which essentially says that any group of shareholders will be able to put on a proxy statement a proposal for how the company should be run. You want to balkanize a company, there's probably no quicker way to do it than to have unilateral proxy access for any issue that is of concern or interest to some group that buys shares. This type of language is essentially put in to promote special interest activity. Now, we all hear around here about how terrible special interests are. Well, this language is special interest language for the purposes of promoting special interest groups, starting with the trial lawyers, of course, but followed up by various people who have a social justice purpose relative to a 
some corporation. Let's take a group, a company like, like McDonald's. Let's say that some group feels that McDonald's is selling too much food that creates the opportunity for people to eat too much and causes obesity. You could have a special interest group that was concerned about that, buy stock, and force a proxy statement fight over what type of food McDonald's should sell. It doesn't stop there, of course. There are all sorts of issues that special interest groups want to promote and change corporate governance about. Now, how you manage a corporation is supposed to be primarily in the hands of the boards of directors who are answerable to the stockholders. And the purpose, of course, is to increase the value of the, the stockholders as a whole and their return on their investment. In most instances, that's the primary purpose of, of a corporation. But this federal access, proxy access, is all about the opposite. It's about pushing agendas onto the management of a corporation through the board of directors, through the proxy process, that are very special interest oriented and are very narrow in their purpose and are not necessarily directed at return on the investment for the stockholders. Just the opposite, in fact. Short-term objectives become the, become the standard of the day under this type of an approach, rather than a long-term view, which is what most of your board of directors are supposed to take relative to these decisions. The immediate, the cause of the day, the cause du jour, could be any number of things, you know, that happens to be the activist view of the day becomes the issue under corporate governance as versus the purpose of managing the corporation well over a long term in order to get adequate return to the shareholders. It's really a, an inappropriate idea, especially inappropriate for the federal government to put it in, put it, to put it, bury it in this bill. It applies to every publicly traded corporation in America, this language, not just the financial institutions. So why is it buried in this bill? It shouldn't be in here. The same can be said of the way this bill, this language approaches directors and, and how, what the shareholders' rights are relative to directors. These have historically been state decisions. And in fact, the state of Delaware, which is obviously the leading state on the issue of, of corporate governance and really has developed the uniform corporate governance structure, which a lot of states have adopted, including my state of New Hampshire, has basically tracks Delaware uh, to a large degree. Uh, that has been the law of the land, for all intents and purposes. Settled law, predictable law, the purpose of which is to have fair and adequate corporate governance where the directors are responsible to the shareholders under a structure that everybody knows the rules and which is controlled by the states. And yet this bill comes in and does fundamental harm to that. For what purpose? Well, because there's an agenda in this Congress to usurp the state's rights to be able to manage corporate law and to put in place of it opinions and ideas which are only supported by a very narrow group of special interests who basically have gotten the ears of people in this, in this Congress. I mean, this is the ultimate special interest legislation. And the implications for these various Companies is that it's going to be darn expensive if you're a smaller, middle-sized company to deal with this type of with this type of federal interference with the management of the company and the proxy process. Very inappropriate initiative. Furthermore, you create this atmosphere where nobody's really going to know who's governing what because you're going to now have state law and you're going to have federal law and you're going to have the SEC's responsibility increase dramatically. Now we already know that the SEC is strained to do what we've asked them to do and they've got some big responsibility. They've got big responsibility in the financial reform area, they've got big responsibility in corporate governance generally. To push this further burden on them is really going to be very difficult for them to meet. Now, I'm, I happen to be a strong supporter of having a very robust SEC. But it should not, we should not 
burden them with an unnecessary whole new set of corporate governance rules, which are already adequately and appropriately addressed by state law, primarily Delaware state law, but other states which have their own corporate rules. And more importantly, we shouldn't undermine the rights of stockholders across this country to be able to get a reasonable return on their investments by being reasonably assured that their management, specifically the directors of the company, are working for the purposes of the company's financial return and strength as versus for the purposes of some special interest group that comes in and wants to put in special interest legislation into the middle of the corporate governance effort, which is exactly what this language is proposed for. That's why it's here. The only reason this language has come forward is because there are a lot of self-proclaimed social justice groups in this country who have decided that they want better access to corporate boards and to have this federal proxy access, which will basically balkanize, as I said earlier, the process of governing and leading these businesses which most Americans are invested in. The vast majority of Americans in this country either have a pension fund, have IRAs, have 401ks, or are personally invested in the stock market. And why do they invest? They invest to get a reasonable return on that investment, either in the way of appreciation or in the way of dividends, or maybe a combination. That's what they do. And most of the savings, a lot of the savings of this country are tied up in that. So why would this language appear, which will basically undermine those stockholders' rights and ability to be, presume and expect that their directors are going to be managing for the purposes of the stockholders at large as versus for a single interest group within the stockholder group that happened to want to put a social justice agenda into the management of that corporation? Uh, makes no sense at all, really unless you happen to be a special interest group. And so we, were, we rail around here all the time. I hear, ironically, from a lot of these groups who are sponsoring this, like Public Citizen, that they're against special interests. And yet, here we have the most significant piece of special interest legislation in this whole bill is an attempt to bootstrap up special interest groups' social agenda and force them on corporations and stockholders who would otherwise not pursue those agendas because they're interested in getting a return on their investment. It is really going to, as I mentioned earlier, make it much more difficult for us to have a vibrant stock market and a, and a corporate structure in this country which is rational and certainly will undermine significantly the state's rights in the area of corporate governance, which have always historically been, had primary responsibility for setting up the rules by which our corporations operate. So I would hope that as this bill moves down the road, this type of language, which is extraneous, totally extraneous to the financial reform effort, because it affects all public corporations, and ironically, the three financial corporations which which are at the core of the problem which we had in 2008 relative to visibility, AIG, Lehman, and I believe one other, maybe Citibank, had a couple of these rules in place anyway. So obviously they, it was, they had nothing to do with it, reducing the implications of the event. Uh, rather, this language is simply put in because some group put somebody's ear. And I would hope it would be taken out before we get to the end of the day. Madam President, I yield the floor.